we, we have been talking the last few weeks. We've been talking about not giving up. We looked at Abraham, and we, we've been in the book of Hebrews. We looked there at Abraham and, you know, his, uh, you know, his life and some of the key things of his life of not giving up, of never surrendering, and to look at the blessing that came to him. Then we looked at Jacob and his name being renamed because he would not give up. He would not stop his wrestling match with God. And then Damien did such a great job last week of opening up the book of Daniel and, and letting us see Daniel in how his integrity and what I love about Daniel is in that first chapter, I believe the eighth verse where it says in the New Living Testament that Daniel had determined himself. He had determined himself that he was going to follow God. He was going to do this. There was nothing. You could take away his name. You could take away his culture. You could take away his clothes. But he was determined you were not going to take out of his heart Jehovah God and what that meant to him. This week, I want to look at the character of Nehemiah. But before we do, I want to go back to Hebrews. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, and Damien also read this last week, but I want to read it to us again so that we will not forget. The writer of Hebrews in that 11th chapter talks about the great people of faith. And what I really love is if you were to begin at verse 32 and read that chapter and read all the way down, chapter 12 and chapter 11, really, they just flow right into each other. There shouldn't be a chapter break there, but there is a chapter break, and so we know these words. It says, therefore, anytime you see the word therefore, you're looking back. You're looking at what took place. Therefore, in the 12th chapter, in the first and the second verses, since we are surrounded by such a large and a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, since we have all these people around us, we have all these people that surround us, all the things that you can see that they did by faith, by faith, by faith they did this. They're trusting God. Well, what should we do? And he says, right here the writer says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us. And let us run with endurance. Now the word for run right here is a Greek word that means, and translated into our language, which means agony. It means Agony. You know, last week, Lily, don't worry, uh, Courtney, many times, you, you know, your dad talked about you you're crying, okay? Courtney was a cross-country runner, and many, many races, she would just give everything that she'd be crying, and she'd come across the finish line. I never understood that, you know, because I never worked that hard, so I, I never understood that. So, uh, you know, I, I felt that. I was feeling that as he was just relaying that story on. Yeah, I, 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 my daughter crying because of doing that. How many of you ever run a 5K? You ever run a 5K? Yeah, okay, quite a few of us. How many of you ever run a 10K? All right, you know, a 10K. How many of you ever done a marathon? Anybody in here do a marathon? Okay, you know, I've done quite a few marathons in my life, and I realized this. When you line up at that starting line in a marathon, because I was never on the starting line. I was about 1,000 people back. But when you get to that, when you get up there, that starting line, you know, I really, my marathons are about 27 miles long because that's how far in the back that I really was. So I'm walking up there. But I realized the only way you finish a marathon is you realize you say to yourself, somewhere out there is a finish line. Somewhere out there is a finish line. And all I have to do is take one more step. I'm only doing one step. One step at a time. One step at a time because somewhere out there is a finish line. And right here, the word, for, the word for race, the word for run is agony. It's agony. We know that in life. We're going to face things in life. We're going to run this long haul of a race, this marathon of life, and it's going to be filled with agony. But only those that are willing to say, I know there's a finish. I know I have a vision for the end. Those that are willing to say, all I need to do is take one step at a time. That's all that I've been asked to do. One step at a time, we will see the end. Because he says this right here, why do we run with agony? Because we need endurance. We need endurance for the race God has set before us. And I want to stop again to mark this. Maybe the most important point, the race that God has set before you. Right now, whatever you're going through, whatever you're struggling, whatever you're doubting, whatever you're thinking about, whatever the questions are in your mind and heart that's going on in your life, God knows because God set the plan for today for you. He knows right now, if you're, in the, if you're here and you've come and you, you have angst over your past life, God knows that because he's directing your race. He directed you here today. If you're here today and you're struggling with any kind of addiction at all, he knows that. You see, he has been with you and orchestrating your race to get you right here today to be able to tell you, don't give up, I love you. He has orchestrated this race of our life. So we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus the champion who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him. He endured the cross, disregarding the shame. Now he 
is seated at the place of honor beside God's throne. He's talking about Jesus, our example, that we not quit running, that we do not give up, that we, we don't quit, we never surrender. Many years ago, Jamie and I, uh, we went to Chicago, Chicagoland, and up where Candace lives, and we ran a Tough mutter. Anybody in here ever run a Tough mutter? Run a Tough mutter. Okay, we had some people in the first service, they ran Tough mutters. A Tough mutter is a 5K race, now they have them in 10K and 15K races, but the organizers of this race, they say to make it fun, you know, it's just not a 5K race, to make it fun, they place 10 to 12 obstacles out in front of you. <laughs> so, you know, anyway, if you understand, any of you, you're going to run a 5K race, it's painful, it's hard, and anything. So let's put obstacles in front of you. And so obstacles, they tell you, they go from easy, which means you may just have to, you know, climb down in some mud and they've got barbed wire over you, you know, and you're just climbing through there and you come out of there and, you know, you got some mud on you. Or, you know, maybe the next one is they've got this, uh, you know, long thing of, of, of bales of bales and bales of hay and you've got to go up and, and tunnels and down and up and down and you get through that. But each one of them gets from easy to difficult. And they tell you, here's what it says in the rules. At any point in time, at any point in time that you feel like you cannot accomplish an obstacle, you have the right to go around it. Now, you know, when I read that rule that day, and we were there lined up with hundreds of other people. I think we were the third race to go off that morning. And, and we were the third ones. And, you know, I said, hey, you know, just let you know, you know, if you come to an obstacle, you come to one of those things, and you don't think you can get over it, just go around it. And they said it in such a nice way. You know, just go around it. You'll be okay. You'd be okay. I looked at Jamie and I said, not me. Uh-uh. You know, I have two spiritual gifts. Two spiritual gifts in my life. I cannot get lost. Uh-uh. I cannot get lost. I always know where I'm at. I'm not lost. I'm disoriented. But I know where I'm at. You know, I'm next to a tree in the woods. I know right where I'm at. You know. Number two, I'm stubborn. Okay, I'm just downright stubborn. So I'm going, you know, she's going, well, huh? you know, she's looked at him. She's going, oh, I'm not doing this one. I'm going, okay, you know, sissy. So, you know, uh, she's not in this service. So, uh, you know, I could, I could talk like that. But anyway, so, we, you know, they got, they got harder and they got harder and they got harder. Now, we came to one that was, it was much like the picture we have here up for you. Ours was about a 10-foot wall. And, and at the top of the wall, it leaned back. And it leans back about, you know, this has got a round thing. It leaned back about a foot, maybe. It's all it leaned back. But to me, if you're running, and this is obstacle number eight of the 11-obstacle course, you know, when you get up there, you're leaning back over this. And so, you know, as you see, you see people helping each other over. I mean, you know, there's this lady. You're, you're, she's truly trusting you. And she, they just let go of her, you know. If she says the wrong thing, whoa, whoa she dropped you. Uh, you know, but so I'm getting up over there. I, I choose a lane. I get in a lane, and I start crawling up this wall. I look up the wall, and I think, whoa, wait a minute. The biggest guy in the world is in front of me. What are you doing in this race, dude? You're going to help you over? There's no way I can hang on, you know, and, and push you over this thing. And then as I'm up there and we're opening this guy over, I look behind me, and behind me is the world's smallest little girl. <laughs> I think I'm never going to get over this. And then I think i got to lift this leg up over this wall, you know. And so I get it about halfway up, and she grabs it and throws it up over there. You know, I go over, and I go, oh, you're pretty strong for a little girl. You know, but we went along, and then you come to the very end. You come to the, one of the last obstacles where you climb up a wall. It's about 25 feet. They have ropes that you can pull yourself up, and it's all muddy, and it's wet. And you get up there, and they call them the, uh, the, the gangplank. You get up on the Ours really looked like a gangplank. It was just a piece of wood. But for the picture up here, it's a little bit different. And it's, you know, these, these people on this next picture, they're just a bunch of sissies. Look at that. It's only like eight feet up. Ours was like 15 feet up off of a muddy-filled pond of water. And then while you're walking the gangplank, they're spraying you with fire hoses of water, you know, spraying you down as you get up. I think that's just to clean you off before you jump in the water. And one of the last obstacles that we went over, really not the hardest obstacle, but it was one that we really enjoyed. And I've showed you this picture before. Jamie, I came to the end of the race, and we'd finished. That was all that mattered. We didn't win. But the last obstacle that we went over was the old fire pit. And we had to jump over the fire pit. And, the, you know, the photographer's out there, and he's yelling at you while you're coming up, give me your best shot, give me your best shot. So, you know, we acted like, she's having fun. I don't know what I'm acting like, uh, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we, we got over that. But the point of that is we didn't win. We didn't win. I never lined up to run any of the races, 5K, marathon. I didn't run any of the <laughs> I'm going to make a name for myself today. I'm going to die. Uh, you know, but no, I never thought I would win. I never planned to win. 
I plan to finish. I plan to get done. One of those reasons is because I paid money to do this. I'm going to get my money's worth. But I am not going to quit. When we look at Nehemiah today, if you'll take your Bibles, take your phones, and open up to Nehemiah, we'll start in the first chapter. We're going to see Nehemiah realize he has a call upon his life. A call that I don't think he was expecting at all. I think we have to read this with the understanding that Nehemiah has been where he is at his whole life. He's not been in Jerusalem. He was probably born as an exile, but he was raised up and he became a very important member, a very important, one of the most important members of the household of King Artaxerxes. He was, he was the cupbearer, the butler, the personal assistant to the king. And so we start in the first chapter and we start in the second verse of that first chapter where I say, I think Nehemiah was taken back a little bit because his brother, he says his brother and a few other people have come back from Jerusalem. And so I can just see them as they get together. He's probably invited them over to the house. He's got snacks out for them, hors d'oeuvres out for them. He's got everything set out for them. He wants to hear. He's got chairs set up around the room. He's, he wants to hear each one of them tell him about how things are going in Jerusalem. And when it comes to verse 3, this is what his brother said. Things are not going well. Things are not going well. As a matter of fact, they're pretty bad. For those who return to the providence of Judah, they are in great trouble. And they are disgraced. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. You know why I think he was probably expecting to hear news, how things were going, everything's going well, everything's being done that was supposed to be done when they went back to Jerusalem. The temple is being built, the walls are being built, everything's going good because it blew him away. Look at the next verse. When I heard that, I sat down and I wept. In fact, for four months, in fact, for days, I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. And we have, his, we, have, we have his prayer. I want you to understand this. Nehemiah is this great book to read because it is a 2,500-year 2, year prayer journal. It's a prayer journal. Nehemiah, if you want to know what to do, you do your own journal. Take Nehemiah as an example. 2,500 years what we have here of his prayers and what happens from his prayers. O Lord, he says, starting in verse 5, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commandments. Listen to my prayer. I mean, you got to be bold, right? He just right off the bat says, God, listen, you are the God of heaven. You're the God of earth. Please listen to me. Have you ever said that? Please, God, listen to me. Well, I want you to know God is listening to you. I believe that our prayers that God is spending most of the time in heaven, sitting on his throne, he's leaning over the edge of the throne. When God's people pray, when God's people come together, when God's people ask him for something, God is excited about that. God is leaning into your prayer life. He said, God, listen to me. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people, Israel. And then he does this. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you gave us. Through your servant Moses, he confesses his prayers. In our prayer life, we need to confess to God. Be honest with God. He knows, but be honest. It's good. It's, it's cleansing for ourselves to be willing to say, God, I am so anxious. God, I'm so frustrated. God, I'm so mad. God, I'm so hurt. God, I feel so bad. It cleanses, and he confesses. Then he says this, please remember. Please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. And look what has happened. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I've chosen for my name to be honored. The people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants, God. Listen to the prayers of those who delight in honoring you. And then listen to this, verse 11. Please grant me success today. He wasn't praying success for his business. He wasn't praying success for his home that he could add on or he could buy a new one. He wasn't praying success that his truck, his car would never break down or he'd get a new one. He wasn't praying for a promotion. He wasn't praying. He was praying for the success, listen to this, that my king will be favorable to me. Are you praying, are we praying today that our coworkers, that God will help us through whatever is going on in our lives, that our coworkers would look at us with, with favor? That they would look at us with open hearts, open minds, open hands, to be able to willing to listen to us, 
about what we say, will they look at our lives and realize that we have been through something powerful and that God has his hand upon us and that we're asking God, God, get their ears in tune with what you want to say through me today, what you want to do through me today. God, my back is against the wall. God, I don't know that I can go to work. I feel terrible, God. Our relationship, our marriage is falling apart. I'm just not sure what I can do, God. But God, let the people around me see you. You see the kind of prayer life that we need? If we're not going to give up, if we're never going to quit, we have got to have that kind of a prayer life into our lives so that God can work through our lives to do the things of greatness that I believe that God truly wants to do with us in the race that he wants to run, wants us to run. But we have to understand, I mentioned this, I'll just say it very quickly because I know where we are all at. You see, and I've said it before, the greatest tool of Satan is discouragement. The greatest tool that Satan will use against any of us today in our lives is discouragement. And discouragement is, is such a devastating tool of Satan because of three things. Number one, we have to realize we all face it. Every one of us in the room, we all face it. We're facing discouragement. Some of us were discouraged yesterday. Some of us will be discouraged tomorrow. Some of us will be discouraged this evening. We, we, just, we can't escape it. That's why it's so terrible. We, we know it's coming. Number two, we, we, it's so reoccurring in our lives. Discouragement just keeps coming right back. It just keeps coming right back. Once we get through one discouraging moment, one discouragement thing in our life, once we get over it, you know what? You know, this, two weeks ago, I went and they, you know, all my tests for cancer were negative. That's the only time you want to hear the word negative. All my tests were negative. But I'm going to die. I'm still going to die. I know that. I didn't, I didn't walk out of there going, oh, God, we got it made. No, I know. I'm going to be sick. I know that. I know where it's coming from. You see, we, we realize it's going to come right back. And third of all, it is so dangerous because it is so highly contagious. We were so worried about a virus. We paid no attention to what the virus was doing to each and every one of us or our family members by discouraging us. You see, it's highly, highly contagious. And we need to overcome it by the will and by the power of God. This book of Nehemiah has it all. I mean, it has people, uh, Nehemiah's heart broken over people's needs and people's lives. We see the planning of a great project. We see the verbal attacks of the enemy, the threats of death from the enemy, people trying to trick Nehemiah and the workers. And then he had the problem of these people had not done anything like this ever in their lives. So how's he going to get all these people together? God has it mapped out, and God mapped it out through him. So the things that I want to talk about this morning, just very quickly, is just simply this. Obstacles are inevitable. Obstacles or inevitable. Opposition is inevitable in our life. We know that we're going to run the race. We know and we've been told the obstacles are out there. But the thing of it is, we've not been given the permission that you can go around any of them. We have to learn by the power of God that we go under them, we go through them, or we go over them. But it is only by the power of God and what we see taking place in the lives of these people with Nehemiah. In chapter 2, we start out reading this in the first few verses in verse 1. Or excuse me, uh, uh, verse 17. Let's jump down to 17. He said this to the people. He had met. He'd gone at nighttime in the darkness. He'd done, after he'd been there for three days, which I really mean, I think he wanted to get in, get settled, get everybody introduced. He had an entourage of people with him. So he's getting everybody introduced. Everybody's feeling okay with everybody that's just come in. There's no walls. Could they be an enemy? No, it's Nehemiah. These are all the people that I brought with me, so everything's okay. And then he says this. So after he goes to the wall, he tells the people we're going to rebuild the wall. Verse 17, you know very well what trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Then I told them, I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me. Do you remember a few weeks ago when I talked about you'll either end up your life with a title or a testimony? Nehemiah had a title. He was the cupbearer, the, the butler. He was the, 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 the food taster. He was, he was the personal assistant to the king. That's a good title. But that title could do him absolutely no good where he was at right now. He had to have a testimony. That title didn't mean anything to these people, so you taste food. Uh, that's why you're a little, little uh, pudgy around the waist there, buddy. You know, you, you, that's what you do. You taste food. How are you going to tell me how to build a wall? I'm sure he thought about that. I'll talk about that more. But he says, the gracious hand of God was upon me, and he relays the story of his months of praying probably. Then I told them about the hand of God had been on me and about my, con uh, my conversation with the king. And then they all replied at once. They yelled back, yes, let's rebuild the wall. Everybody's happy. Everybody gets to work. Boy, they're going to get to work. Everybody's slapping high fives on each other. They're probably making plans. You can see in chapter 3 all the plans and how it went together. But in verse 19, but, but, but when Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, heard of our plans, they scoffed 
contemptuously. They mocked them. They made fun of them. They jeered them. They said things to them to hurt their feelings. They, they accused them. First of all, you can see that right after they accused them that you've only come here to destroy us. You've come to overthrow us. You really haven't come to build a wall. Who are you? You ever built a wall? No, see? Everybody listen. He's lying to you. Verse 20. I replied, the God of heaven will help us succeed. He'd asked for success. He believed in his prayer. When God gave him success with the king, he gave him success to build the wall. The God of heaven will help us succeed. We as servants will start rebuilding this wall, but you have no share, you have no legal right, you have no historical claim in Jerusalem. Man, he put his foot down, didn't he? You see, you're able to put your foot down when you realize and you say, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. When people are talking about you and talking to you, putting you down, you realize, I will not give up. Those obstacles are coming, and I've determined by my prayers to God, I will not quit. I will not surrender. But second of all, we better realize opposition comes with insufficiency. Opposition comes with insufficiency. As I said, cupbearer, butler, personal assistant, food taster. It's probably a two-month journey from where he was at to Jerusalem. I've got to imagine, okay? Again, just imagine. I've got to imagine he probably bought a, brought a wall builder with him, don't you think? You think that would be a good idea? He brought a bunch of people with him. He asked for letters to be able to get timber and wood. He's brought in all this stuff. Somewhere along the way, Nehemiah would have got one guy with him and said, hey, every night let's watch YouTube channels and you teach me how to build a wall, okay? Let's get this down. i got to have confidence when I get there i got to believe that God's going to do something with me when we get there because people are going to tell me I'm insufficient. You see, friends, I know right now the calling upon your heart and your life, someone in your life, somewhere, and if it is not a person, it is Satan himself saying, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. You could never do that. And you're not, you're not helping here. You're not signing up here. You're not doing something out of your comfort zone. I want to, I want to tell you right now, if your dreams are so small that you can do them all on yourself, your dreams are too small. I want to have a dream. I can't do it. I want to have a dream where I realize, God, I cannot do that. I, there's no way I could do that because I need God to show up and do what God needs to do in my life. And I'm asking you to do that. Carterville Christian, the world is waiting for a mass group of people to get up and do the job. Now, not just the opposition from insufficiency. There's going to be the opposition from the enemy. Look in chapter 4. He gets started right away. In verse 1, Sam Ballot was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall, no matter what he said, we got to work. We went out, and I assigned the plan of what everybody would do, and we got to work. We need to understand something this morning. My friends, we are all going to face struggles in life. I've said that. We need to understand we, what we are. We were, we were created for a relationship, a union with Jesus Christ, and Satan doesn't want that. Satan is against that union. And too often, I, I share this for all of us. I want to be an encouragement right now. Too often when we face things, struggles, things go wrong, things are bad in our lives. You know, we don't overcome right away. We're still struggling with an addiction. Our marriage is still messed up. Maybe, maybe there's been a divorce. Our children, uh, they have gone away. They don't want to talk to us. We, we, we got a bad thing at work. And we all say the same thing. Oh, God, why are you against me? Why are you against me? Oh, God, why are you against me? Why? Where are you at, God? Where are you at? And we got to realize right here, God says, listen, when you're facing a struggle, when you're facing something hard, why don't we admit who it is? It's Satan. He's out to get every one of us. He's out to tear every one of us down. He's out to take the call that God has laid upon your life and destroy that call so that you'll do nothing. You will not follow. You will not find the power of God in your life because the enemy is saying to you, well, if it was good, if things were good right now, if you were a good Christian, if you were a good person, everything would be smooth. That's a lie. I love smooth times. I do. But I have to realize smooth times are not a stamp of approval of my life. The stamp of approval of my life is when I have to face a struggle that I have no way to overcome that struggle but through God. James, Jesus' brother, wrote to James, the first chapter and the second verse, he said this, when troubles of any kind, you're going to have them. When troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for joy. Consider what you're facing, an opportunity for joy. And so 
In verse number two, we read, saying in front of the friends, his friends, he got, now he gets together people. You need to understand that. Critics will always gather together more people around him. So his friends, the Samaritan army officers, what does this bunch of people, these feeble Jews, think they're doing? Do you think they can build a wall in a single day just by offering a few sacrifices? That's where they made a mistake. We'll get back to that. Do they actually think they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap and, and charred ones of that? And then Tobiah, the Ammonite, said this. He made a big mistake in a couple of reasons. That stone wall. Now, you, I don't want you to, to imagine in your mind that they're taking stones, you know, like we have around here, rocks in our yard in Missouri, and they're trying to pile them up. No, these, these stones would be 10 feet wide, 10 feet high. A fox is not going to cause one of these to fall over. Matter of fact, the fox could fall off of them. The fox could hurt themselves, but he, the fox is not going to cause any of those stones to fall over. And the second mistake they made, they acted like the Jews were building the wall. You see, we may make the mistake that if God has called you to something, right now you know God has called you to do something for God. He's called you to be humble. He's called you to submit to something. He's called you to say something, to go somewhere, to do something you never imagined that you could ever do. I'm going to tell you right now, that's God. And Satan's going to tell you you can't do it. He's going to say to you, there's no way you could say that. There's no way you could do that. There's no way you can be that. You can't overcome that. But by the power of God, when God gets into your life, you can overcome when God gets in our lives, we can change our lives around because God will give us the power to change, the spirit to change. We got to realize when the enemy comes, the enemy's going to tell us, you can't do that. Now, there's also, as we come getting close to the end here, there is the opposition of progress. There's the opposition of progress. Look in verse 6 through 10. At last, the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city, for the people had worked with enthusiasm. Every day they're showing up, man. They're loving it every day. You ever had a job like that? Showing up, you can't wait to get there every day. You love the people you're working with. You love what you're doing. You just can't believe what we get to do this. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs, the Ammonites, and see how much bigger it's getting and the Ashdites, well, look, look what critics do to you. They just keep bringing more and more people in and tell you you're not making it. And the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired. They were furious. They all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw them into confusion. But we prayed. But we prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. Now remember, here's, what, here's where it gets. Then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired. And there's so much rubble to be removed. You see, we all have rubble in our lives. We call it baggage now. Every couple that we do premarital counseling with we often ask them, what's your baggage? What are you bringing into this relationship? We all got a bag somewhere back in the closet that's filled with dirty clothes from a past relationship or a past life or, or maybe the way we were raised. We're bringing in something. Rubble is baggage. And when we let the rubble, when we let the baggage of our life stop us, we're going to quit. We're going to give up. But God's saying, don't look at the rubble. Get rid of the rubble. I'm sure Nehemiah, when he heard that, one of the plans, he didn't say, Here's, get rid of the rubble then. Let's just move it out of the way. Let's get those stones going. Let's go. But that's, we read what they said, what happened. And also, I just want to point out the, the Judah, Judah, <laughs> Judah and the people of Judah should have been the leaders. But listen, what happened? They said, we'll never be able to build this wall by ourselves. You're right. Meanwhile, our enemies... We're saying before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and we will kill them and end their work. And the Jews who live near the enemy came and told us again and again, they will come from all the directions and attack us. So Nehemiah places guards and all the people go to work with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. But did you see there? Who were they listening to? They were listening to the enemies. They were listening to the people that were telling them, you can't do this. And the world right now is telling us we can't do this. We can't be a church that will stand up for the rights of other people. You can't do that and not grow. You can't preach the gospel. You can't teach the gospel. You can't live the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and be a church that impacts your community. You see, those are all lies. And the more people we listen to, the more news we listen to, the more enemies that we let into our minds and into our hearts telling us that we cannot do something for God, then we will not do it. We will come running and say, we can't do this all by ourselves. And here's the good news today. My friends, we are not going to do it by ourselves. We're going to do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
We're going to do it by the power of God that comes over each one of us because we all have a calling. Your calling is not this stage, and your calling, because it's not this stage, doesn't mean it's less than mine. Matter of fact, many of you have greater callings than I could ever have. You have greater callings because you have a calling to your family, to where you work, and to your life, and what God wants to do in your life, and it's far greater than mine. But God's got to be in it. Now, there's something that happened with all of this that I want to close with. You see, what happened was they lost their momentum, starting in verse 10. They lost their momentum. You, you know what momentum is tonight. They'll probably talk about that in these games that are going to go on. One team will be going down the field. They'll be moving down the field. They'll be scoring touchdown after touchdown, and then something will happen. They'll say, oh, there's a momentum shift. You know, somebody fumbles the ball. There's an interception. There's a penalty. And all oh, the momentum just shifted. Everything changed. You see, what these people have is a momentum shift, and Nehemiah has to remind them. You see, when they had a momentum shift, they lost their strength, but Nehemiah reminds them, it's not you that will build the wall. It is God that will build the wall. It is God because he begins to pray again. In that fourth chapter, he begins to pray to God again about what is going on. He reminds them, this is not about your enemies. Don't be afraid. Remember who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers and your sisters, your sons, your daughters. When we lose momentum, we lose vision. We lose the vision of the calling that God has upon you. When we lose momentum, we lose the confidence that we have to build this wall. And finally, when we lose vision, we lose the security that we know God is with us. So how do we do it? Three things I want to encourage you with this morning. Matter of fact, get back to work. That's what Nehemiah says. Just embrace your obstacles. Embrace them. Right now, whatever is going on, don't try to run from it. Don't try to run around it. Face your obstacle. Stand at the bottom of that wall. Look up at that wall and go, I can't do this by myself, God. I've got to have you. I'm going to take the step. I'm going to grab a hold of the rope. I'm going to run up that hill. I'm going to do whatever you've asked me to do, God, but I cannot do it by myself. You've got to go with me, and I'm sure you will begin to feel God's power take over in your life. Embrace the obstacle. Preserve in prayer. Preserve in prayer. I said this is a, a prayer journal, 25 year, 2,500 years old prayer journal of a man that faced obstacles and opposition, but he prayed. Look at his prayers. Highlight his prayers, what he says, what he asks God for. He praises God. He reminds God, and he opens himself up to God for God to use him. And last of all, what I said, just get to work. Get to work. It's time to go to work. It's time to put everything behind us. It's time, if you've not given your life to Jesus Christ, to say, this is the day. This is the day I turn my life over to Jesus Christ. This is the day I enter that baptism, those waters of baptism, so that my life will be transformed by the very power of God. Maybe today is the day that you say, I want to rededicate my life. We have people in the back that will pray for you. They will pray over you, that God can use you, that God will take your calling that you know you have upon your heart and do something great with it. But don't put it off. Embrace it. Pray it. Get to work. Let's build that wall of strength and power that God has for our lives. Would you stand with me this morning? If you have a decision to make, please go to the back. Come up front so we can pray with you about it.